presentations, live streams, and more. And if, uh, you can find those at youtube.com slash rethinking hell. Um, as Rudolph mentioned, you can find my Amazon uh, authors page at amazon.com slash author slash Chris Date. And there are the four books that I've had the honor of, of publishing. And, and hopefully that list will grow in the not too distant future. And then finally, I've got some journal articles as well. You can find on my academia.com. Uh, to contrast three and then really two. Then we're going to look at the doctrine of eternal torment in church history. Then we're going to look at the doctrine of eternal torment in Bible and theology. Then we're going to look at conditional immortality, also known as annihilationism, in church history. And then we're going to look at the same thing in Bible and theology. And then finally, I will turn things over to you to ask me questions. So let's begin by comparing and contrasting three or really two views of hell and or fiction. And I'm delighted to be able to tell you the answer to that question is fact. So we can all just go home, right? We've, we've answered the question. Um, well, no, the reality is that the fact of eternal punishment only rules out one of three views. The other two views both affirm eternal punishment. So let me explain what I mean by that. This is uh, what we at Rethinking Hell call the Hell Triangle, and it represents all three major views of hell on, um, on a triangle. In the bottom left corner here, you've got what's known as the traditional view called eternal torment or eternal conscious punishment. You might also be familiar, possibly, with the doctrine of annihilationism or conditional immortality here in the billiard with the view known as universalism or universal reconciliation, which is here at the top of the triangle. All three of these views have had respectable adherents um, and defenders in church history from, you know, conservative Orthodox Christian perspectives. Now, um, I said that eternal punishment is a fact, and I think that it is. And one of the things that this triangle helps to illustrate is that um, every pair of these three views shares something in common that the other the third view does not. So if you look at the bottom edge of the triangle, you can see that it says punishment eternal. That means that both eternal torment and conditional immortality or annihilationism affirm that the punishment of hell is eternal and that, it, and that the other view, universalism, does not. Now, we're not going to go into great depth in universalism at all in this presentation. That would require another, um, another, uh, another exploration into the biblical data. Um, but suffice it to say that these two views at the bottom that in, uh, in which uh, punishment is eternal of hell, those are the views that we're going to compare and contrast today. But there's something that they don't have in common that the eternal torment view has in common with universalism. Namely, it affirms that all human beings are or will be immortal. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the immortality of the soul, although that is also something that they affirm. Um, but I'm talking about the immortality of the resurrected person. So all three of these views share belief that one day the dead is, uh, are, are going to be raised from the dead. They're going to come back out of the graves, back to life. Their, their disembodied souls reunited with their resurrection bodies. And the question then becomes, what happens to resurrected lost people? Well, according to the doctrine of eternal torment and the doctrine of universalism, those resurrected lost people are going to be made immortal, not just in soul, but also in body. So they will physically live forever. The difference between the two of those views is that one of them says everybody will eventually repent and be saved. The other one says, no, they'll suffer forever in hell. But that's this universal immortality view is not true of the third view, conditional immortality or annihilationism. According to that view, um, the lost will be raised still mortal. And that only the saved, when they are raised from the dead, will be made immortal and live forever. The lost will instead die a second time, be destroyed, both body and soul, and never live or experience anything ever again. That's why it's called annihilationism. But again, the issue is the question of who will be recipients of immortality. So um, to compare these two views, which we'll dive into in, in more detail in a moment, um, the view on the left, traditionalism or eternal torment, you, you, this, according to this view, the unsaved are raised immortal, body and soul. They will live physically forever in hell. And the nature of the eternal punishment is suffering. So it's something like um, eternal torture. Uh, 
Um, although that isn't a, uh, a way that many believers in this view would describe it. And so maybe it would be more appropriate in today's environment to describe it as something like an everlasting prison sentence. So it's like being in isolation in prison by yourself for all eternity. According to the other view, conditional immortality, the unsaved are raised still mortal. And their punishment will be literally a second death. They will die again in hell and never experience or live any, uh, anything at all ever again. So this view is something more like the, the electric chair hanging or the uh, or lethal injection or whatever. So it's, it's capital punishment. It's execution. Indeed, we have biblical examples of, of this kind of punishment in the likes of Sodom and Gomorrah and killed the inhabitants of Gomorrah. So as we go through the um, biblical and theological material today, keep these two views in mind. Which views, uh, which of these two views does the biblical data better um, cons better support? The idea that the lost will be raised immortal and live forever, or that they will be raised mortal and die again in hell? That'll be the question that I'll leave to you at the end of this presentation. Now, let's talk about eternal torment in church history. And importantly, this isn't, again, just to reiterate, this isn't merely eternal torment, eternal torment. it's eternal embodied life in torment. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate that as we walk through some of the figures in church history that have promoted this view. Um, now, it's very you know, very often you will hear, cr hear critics of my view say that the traditional view of eternal torment has been the church's teaching for 2,000 years. But that's not quite true. The earliest believers in eternal torment that you will find among the writings of the church fathers is in the second half of the second century with Tatian of Adia Bene. And then in that same uh, period of time, you also have Athenagoras of Athens. These are two the two earliest believers in eternal torment that I can find among the writings of the uh, of the church. Fast forward a few centuries to 400s to the 400s and you have Augustine and of course he was incredibly influential and his stamp of approval on the doctrine of eternal torment um, is, it appears to be what has caused it to become so dominant amongst you know in church tradition ever since. And notice that he's saying that the faculty of immortality, which the human spirit has right now, will also be in the resurrected bodies of the damned. So again, this is immortality, not just a soul, but also a body in hell. Fast forward a few hundred years to Anselm of Canterbury. He also says that um, the wicked will be in eternal misery, not being deprived of life, so they will live forever in hell. A couple of hundred years later, you've got Thomas Aquinas saying that after the resurrection, immortality will be communicated to the body for everyone. So again, we're talking about embodied life and immortality in hell forever. Fast forward to the time of the Reformation, and John Calvin and uh, the other reformers continue um, this affirmation of eternal life in hell. Um, he says that it would be um, unjudgment or unjust for the wicked to be consumed by death on the final day. They instead have to be punished with vengeance throughout eternity. Um, fast forward to the Great Awakening, and Jonathan Edwards uh, also says that the resurrected bodies of the wicked will be immortal. And this just continues to go on and on. Charles Spurgeon, about 100 years later, says that man was condemned to live forever in hell. And stretching even into the modern uh, modern era, C.S. Lewis, John MacArthur, John Piper, um, uh, Robert Peterson, Mark Driscoll, Wayne Grudem, and a host of others, they, they consistently make clear that according to this doctrine of eternal torment, the resurrected lost will be made bodily immortal and live physically forever in hell. But as you can see, it is a um, very ancient Christian view stretching back to uh, as early as 160 AD or CE, um, and it is the dominant view ever since the time of Augustine. Now, let's talk about some of the biblical and theological issues that motivate belief in eternal torment. First of all, there's the biblical language of eternal punishment in Matthew 25, 46, alongside eternal fire. Um, or, uh, sorry, we'll get to eternal fire shortly. Um, so there's there's this issue of eternal punishment, and the argument goes that if um, if the life of the redeemed is going to be eternal, then so too must the punishment of the damned. And that's true, but we'll talk about that in a bit. 
There's also the language of smoke rising from torment forever in Revelation 14, 9 to 11, and the beast worshipers having no rest day or night. This is also a big motivator for um, the doctrine of eternal torment. And then there's Revelation 20, 10 to 15, in which the devil, the beast, and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever and ever, which some believers in eternal torment think is what the eternal fire of Matthew 25, 41 is talking about. Now, these three passages, Matthew 25, 41 to 46, Revelation 14, 9 to 11, and Revelation 20, 10 to 15, are known by us in the conditionalist community as the big three. Um, and according to the big three texts of, of, of um, uh, that we've talked about here, the punishment is as, as, is as eternal as life, as eternal life is, and smoke rises from torment forever in a lake of fire. Next, we can look at um, the language of unquenched fire. In Mark 9, 48, for example, Jesus says the fire of Gehenna is not quenched. And the argument, according to believers in eternal torment, is that this is an indication that the fires of hell will forever provide fuel um, or be provided fuel by wicked sinners who live forever in hell. There's also the repeated language in the, in the Gospels about weeping and gnashing of teeth, which believers in eternal torment think is uh, uh, speaks to the agony of protracted torment in hell. And then there's the language of death as separation, allegedly. Uh, so, for example, Paul tells the Colossians that you were once dead in your trespasses, but God has made you alive together with Jesus. And it's further argued that in Genesis 2.17, God warns Adam that on the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Um, of course, they didn't physically die for another some 900 years, and so it's argued that they must have spiritually died when they sinned uh, on that very day. And therefore, death from the beginning is not the end of life. It's some sort of separation from God. Indeed, they are at that point kicked out of the garden, separated from God for the rest of their earthly lives. So these um, supporting texts, which speak of unquenchable fire, undying worms, weeping and gnashing of teeth, um, these confirm the, the eternal torment believers um, thinking that eschatological death is separation from God rather than the end of life. So those are some biblical issues that motivate eternal torment, and there's one arguable uh, uh, theological issue that motivates the doctrine of eternal torment more than any other, which is the uh, the atoning work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. According to this reasoning, Christ's, uh, Christ is, inf is infinite in worth and in value because he's the God-man. He's both God and human, um, which I totally agree with. He is, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and so, uh, so the question is, why did God have to become incarnate to suffer for our sins, it's because the punishment of hell is infinite. And the only way to substitute for an infinite punishment is for the infinite God to become man and bear it. Uh, and then as far as a rebuttal to my perspective, it is, is often argued that if the punishment of hell is the cessation of existence rather than everlasting torment, then in order to bear our punishment, Jesus must have ceased to exist. And that only leaves two options. Either he ceased to exist only as a man, but continued to exist as God, in which case the hypostatic union between his human and divine natures was temporarily broken, which would be heretical. Or he ceased to exist as both God and man, in which case the Trinity was temporarily rendered a binity, which would also be heretical. So according to this theological reasoning, um, hell must be infinite punishment because the God-man bore it for us, and the God-man, of course, could not have ceased to exist. So this is a, a sampling of what a biblical and theological case for the doctrine of eternal torment might look like. Um, there aren't that many other texts or issues that bear on the question. Um, so I think I've done a good job of representing the case, and it's the case that I once accepted years ago when I still believed in eternal torment. But let's turn at this point now to the doctrine of conditional immortality, beginning with its representation in church history. And here's what's interesting. We looked at the earliest defender of eternal torment in uh, church history, in the likes of Tatian and Athenagoras in the latter half of the second century, 160 to 175 AD or CE. But you find conditional immortality in the writings of the church fathers even earlier. 
So, for example, Clement of Rome, writing in about 95 CE, talks about life in life in immortality being a gift of God. And he says that um, righteous conduct is what um, achieves an attainment of life. And the language of life that he uses, zoe is a noun and zao is the verb, um, these, this language throughout his epistle speak of ordinary bodily life. That's what the gate of righteousness leads to, is having bodily life forever, immortality. Right around that same period of time, around 100 CE, um, Ignatius of Antioch um, is also a conditionalist. He says that people who deny the resurrection of Christ should accept it because, because their denial of it means they incur death, and it would be better for them to accept it so that they could one day rise again. Notice he's he's either denying that the wicked will rise at all, which seems incredibly difficult to do in light of the multi multiple uh, biblical teachings that the wicked will rise, or they will rise long enough to be judged and killed again. Um, that's, I think, what Ignatius has in mind. He also says that the Christ suffered in order to breathe immortality into his church, not into all humankind. And indeed, he says that were God to reward us according to our works, we would cease to be. Um, possibly earlier, but more likely a little bit later, the writer of the Epistle of Barnabas, writing somewhere between 70 and 130 CE, says that the one who um, chooses other things than, than are appropriate for the kingdom of God will be destroyed with his works. And the word that he uses for destroyed is soon apollomy, and the word apollomy, the, the, the verb part of that compound verb, is a verb that the writer uses elsewhere to refer to the destruction Jesus suffered on the cross, death. And then again, writing around the same time, but possibly early, possibly later, is the um, are the writers of the Didache. They speak of immortality, which has been made known to the church through Jesus, and they talk about two ways, one of life and one of death. And again, the language of life, zoe and zao, is used elsewhere in the Didache to refer to ordinary embodied life. It's never a reference to some sort of spiritual life or union with God. Now, around the same time as Tatian and Athenagoras, who were teaching eternal torment in the second, second half of the second century, right around that same time, you have Irenaeus of Lyon um, and his famous work against heresies. He says that the one who rejects God's gift of salvation deprives himself of continuance and length of days forever and ever. So we still see conditional immortality or annihilationism alive and well in this time period. Um, we have fast forward a little over 100 years to Arnobius of Sicca. Arnobius of Sicca was a church father that had some very questionable views, um, but he was a, an annihilationist. He speaks of the immortality that must be uh, received in order to escape destruction, um, a destruction that he says is inflicted by the fires that can't be quenched, which is annihilation. And although this church father has some questionable views, he's nevertheless called a church father, had a respected uh, following, and, um, and, and nevertheless, and, and so therefore represents a um, Christian in early church history that believed in annihilationism. In fact, later in that um, century, just a little bit later in that century, Athanasius the Great, who would go on after the Council of Nicaea to be one of the lone defenders of Trinitarian orthodoxy until the latter part of that fourth century, Athanasius the Great in his book On the Incarnation of the Word says that the reason that Jesus became a human being was because human beings um, who came from nothing were returning to nothing because of their sin. And in his discourse too against the Arians, he says that um, the church, you know, that the Christians um, through Jesus will uh, truly abide forever, risen from the dead and clothed in immortality and in corruption. So remember, we looked at those church fathers and later who all talked about immortality and living forever being something that the wicked will have will do in hell. But here Athanasius is saying no, immortality and corruption is something achieved through Christ, um, because apart from Christ, people are returning to nothingness. Now, uh, we, uh, about 100 years later or so, we get to Augustine. We talked about how since the time of Augustine, the doctrine of eternal torment dominated church thought um, and continues to dominate church thought. And so, indeed, we find that for hundreds, th even a thousand years or more, we find no conditionalists or annihilationists, or at least not that I've been able to find. But, that's, but there started to be conditionalists again in the time of the Reformation, a few scattered ones. But unfortunately, most of them up until the 19th century were 
heretics, um, Sassinians and, um, uh, and, and other heretics. But by the time of the 19th century to 1800s, both in America and in Europe, conditional immortality or annihilationism flourished amongst both um, American theologians and European theologians. Here, for example, is William Glenn Moncrief, um, who was Scottish, I believe, and he talks about the doctrine of literal destruction um, being uh, the best way um, for God to motivate people to accept Christ. And he says that even though that is the best motivation and, and what he believes is to be the case, he nevertheless, nevertheless talks about the love of Jesus being the most uh, primary motive for accepting Christ. Uh, and then and then also Charles Hudson in that same century in his book Debt and Grace talks about the exclusion from all life being the punishment of the lost in hell. Um, but where we really start to see it pick up steam in the modern era is in the 19th century. Um, we have Basil Adkinson, not pictured here, but also Harold Giabod and his The Righteous uh, the righteous Judge. And he says that the general trend of Bible teaching on future punishment points to destruction in the sense of ending of conscious existence. Um, we have the now infamous John Stott in his Evangelical Essentials debate with David Edwards. He says that um, immortality is something only God possesses and gives to the church through the gospel. Um, and David Stott, uh, or sorry, John Stott sort of was a, uh, caused a fire, a firestorm um, because he came out in defense of annihilationism in this book. Um, other British evangelicals that were influential and uh, affirmed conditional immortality included Philip Edgecombe Hughes and... Um, Stephen Travis and John Wenham. John Wenham pictured here, sorry, and then Stephen Travis pictured in another slide. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, e. Earl Ellis it was an American, I believe. I, I could be wrong about that, but he also was a respected um, theologian and taught annihilationism or conditional immortality. Here is Stephen Travis, whom I mentioned a moment ago. Um, and then, as uh, Rudolph mentioned before we started the presentation, Edward Fudge, who has passed away a couple of years ago um, and was good friends with the ministry here at Rethinking Hell, his book, The Fire That Consumes, um, is in its third edition now and remains the seminal work in defense of conditional immortality and annihilationism. Um, <clears throat> Glenn Peoples is part of the Rethinking Hell team. He's a well-known Christian philosopher in New Zealand, um, and he wrote the, one of the introductory chapters to our book, Rethinking Hell. Uh, and John Stackhouse spoke at our very first Rethinking Hell conference. He's a respected theologian and apologist um, in Canada. Um, last I heard, he, I, I think he's on the east coast of Canada now. He's an annihilationist or, or a conditionalist. Terence Thiessen was once a dean of a, um, of a seminary. He's a respected theologian, reformed Calvinist um, like I am. Um, and in our second book, A Consuming Passion, he explains his long journey to annihilationism. Uh, and then one more name that I'll drop is Preston Sprinkle. Interestingly, Preston Sprinkle co-wrote Erasing Hell with Francis Chan a few years ago, and they ended up siding with the doctrine of eternal torment. But very shortly thereafter, we at Rethinking Hell were among those who persuaded Preston Sprinkle that the Bible teaches conditional immortality and annihilationism. And in his conference presentation at our 2018 conference, um, he makes the case that both Old and New Testaments and the intertestamental literature make clear that the final punishment of the loss is total, final, irreversible destruction, not uh, everlasting torment. So you can see that whereas the doctrine of eternal torment enjoys pretty consistent support, um, you know, initially beginning in the latter half of the second century and then really picking up steam with Augustine, it remains the dominant view to today. Um, nevertheless, prior to Augustine and, and, and the earliest church fathers indeed taught conditional immortality and annihilationism. And although there was a very wide, you know, very long gap of time before the Reformation when individuals started coming up with it or, you know, re re rediscovering the doctrine of annihilationism. Nevertheless, um, that has gained a lot of steam beginning in the 19th century and continues to gain converts today. So now let's turn to some of the biblical and theological reasons for thinking that uh, annihilationism or conditional immortality is true. Firstly, um, and here again, we're going to start with the issue of eternal punishment. We conditionalists agree that the lost will be recipients of eternal punishment in hell, but we contend that the punishment is capital punishment, death forever. It's not the duration of the punishment that we disagree about, it's, it's nature. 
Notice that the punishment, the everlasting punishment, must not also consist in eternal life, because those are the two opposing destinies, um, and there's no middle option. Um, so the only eternal punishment that excludes eternal life is eternal death. But that's not the only reason for thinking that that's what Jesus is talking about here. Um, firstly, the word colossus, or colossus, the, the Greek word translated punishment, that's a word that does in, in, in some cases refer to some sort of uh, torment as punishment. But in a few places in inter intertestamental literature, it refers to the punishment of death, as it does, for example, in 3 Maccabees 7, 10, and 14. And notice that this, this punishment of death is more consistent with the biblical language elsewhere about the punishment for sin, like Romans 6.23, in which Paul says the wages of sin is death. Um, we can also, and so, so, uh, so we're talking here about it being the everlasting punishment of death. And sometimes people ask the question, well, how then can it be eternal punishment? Once you're dead, isn't it over? Well, that mistakes, that's a mistaken understanding of what phrases like eternal punishment um, often refer to. If you look at Hebrews 5.9, the phrase eternal salvation doesn't refer to the everlasting process of being saved. It refers to the everlasting result of being saved. The result of saving, the result of Christ's saving work is eternal salvation. Likewise, in Hebrews 9.12, eternal redemption doesn't refer to the everlasting process of redeeming. It refers to the everlasting result of Christ's redemptive process. Um, in each of the, in these cases and others, what is eternal isn't the process of the cognate verb, like punish or save or redeem, but the outcome of the cognate verb. So the punishment of being the, the punishment that results from being killed is the punishment of death forever. Um, this is exactly how Augustine describes the nature of the death penalty, how it's measured. He explains in his City of God that laws around the globe reckon the punishment of death to consist not in the brief moment in which death is inflicted, but in that the offender is eternally banished from the society of the living. So eternal punishment, if we write that it's the death penalty, makes perfect sense because they will be dead forever. Now, this is why Jesus goes on in verse, or, or well, actually earlier in verse 41, says that the wicked are going to depart into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This isn't reference to burning forever in hell. This is a reference to being destroyed by divine fire. Um, for example, Jude uses the phrase eternal fire to describe the fire that came down from uh, heaven and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He calls that the punishment of eternal fire and says that Sodom and Gomorrah suffered it as an example of what awaits the wicked. We, uh, we see in Genesis 19 the description of this divine fire destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven in Genesis 19.24. Notice that the fire is coming from God himself, the eternal God. Um, and we also see that elsewhere in the New Testament, the fiery destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is what's held up as an example, um, like Luke 17, 29, in which Jesus speaks of the day when Lot went out from Sodom and fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Um, uh, now, in, now, importantly, the parallel to Jude 7 is 2 Peter 2, 6, in which Peter says that by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, God condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. This is, a, as scholars recognize, a parallel to Jude 7. Both authors are, one is either drawing upon the other or they're drawing from a shared tradition. So this punishment of eternal fire that Jude says was suffered by Sodom and Gomorrah is the punishment of extinction that Peter talks about uh, being the example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So eternal fire is, the, is what kills um, sinners. It's not fire that keeps people alive for any duration of time. And the reason that it is called eternal fire is because God, whence that fire comes, is the eternal God. He's the quintessential consuming fire. You see, fire from God is eternal at its source, and it destroys. It doesn't keep alive forever. So Matthew 25, 41 to 46 isn't um, support for the doctrine of eternal torment, at least in my view. It's rather support for the notion that eternal punishment is inflicted by eternal fire and is death forever, not immortality and eternal life in hell. 
Now, as for unquenchable fire, the language of Mark 9, 48, where Jesus says that the wicked will be thrown into Gehenna, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, um, Jesus is not coming up with this language on its on his own. He's quoting Isaiah 66, 24, um, where it's explicitly said to be the dead bodies of God's slain enemies um, whose worm will not die and whose fire will not be quenched. This language of fire not being quenched is not talking about a fire that never dies out. That's a mistaken understanding. To quench does not mean to die out. To quench means to be, to put out. And what happens when you fail to put out a fire? It burns things up. Indeed, else, elsewhere where the Bible refers to the fiery wrath of God, it talks about the fiery wrath of God being unquenchable in the sense that it can't be put out and so completely devours, like the green and dry trees it devours in Ezekiel twenty forty seven, and the um, palaces of Jerusalem that it will devour according to Jeremiah seventeen twenty seven. And that's the parallel to the worm that does not die. Uh, oh, and I'll, and I'll add that in the New Testament, unquenchable fire is the same thing. For example, John the Baptist in, in Matthew 3.12 says that the chaff of Jesus will burn with unquenchable fire fire. But the word translated burn is the Greek word katakaio, which doesn't mean to just simply burn. It means to burn up, to be to burn down, to reduce to ashes. So, for example, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, when Moses sees the bush burning but not consumed, the Greek word translated burning is kaio, but the, tr the word translated consumed is katakaio. So the burning bush was not was kaio, but it was not katakaio. But John the Baptist says that what unquenchable fire does is katakaio, chaff, it burns it up. So unquenchable fire completely destroys, and it's the parallel of the worm that does not die. So the worm that does not die um, is a maggot that eats corpses. Um, indeed, earlier in Isaiah, that's what it refers to, the, the worms, the maggots that consume um, bodies in the ground. So the worm that does not die is a maggot that won't be prevented by death from fully consuming the corpses upon which it feeds. Indeed, the imagery is strikingly similar to Jeremiah 7.33, in which um, Jeremiah predicts that the dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and none will frighten them away. Because the beasts and birds can't be frightened away from, their, from the corpses they're feeding upon, they will completely eat them up. And so as Michael Brown explains in his commentary on Jeremiah, the corpses will remain unburied, becoming food for beast and bird, the ultimate disgrace and the worst possible fate imaginable. So uh, in Mark 9, 48, unquenchable fire and undying worms are things that can't be stopped prematurely from completely consuming corpses. These are dead people, not living immortals. Now, as for eternal torment, eternal torment does appear in the apocalyptic symbolic imagery of the book of Revelation. For example, in Revelation 14, 9 to 11, beast worshipers are um, promised to, to be made to drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and tormented with fire and sulfur, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. But as we will see, the language of eternal torment in, um, in the book of Revelation is authoritatively interpreted by people in the text itself as symbolizing death and destruction. So, for example, each of these three images in Revelation 14, 9 to 11, um, the drinking of God's wrath, the suffering fire from, from fire and sulfur and smoke rising forever, all three of those images are used later in the book of Revelation in chapters 18 and 19, where the harlot, Mystery Babylon, is, is told, uh, she, uh, the church is told to make her drink God's wrath. She's said to be tormented in fire in multiple places, and a chorus cries out in Revelation 19, 3, hallelujah, the smoke from her rises forever and ever, the exact same language used in Revelation 14, 9 to 11. So all the same symbols are in place, but notice what the angel interprets this imagery as symbolizing when he tells John, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. You see, the angel is telling John that this imagery of fire, uh, so, torment and fire and sulfur and smoke rising from torment forever is symbolism communicating the destruction of the city the harlot represents. This language, uh, and this is also true of Revelation 20, 10 to 15. The devil, the beast, and the false prophet are all thrown into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever and ever in the imagery. But 
the question is what that imagery symbolizes. And for this, we can turn to Daniel for some help. You see, the um, the the uh, uh, the beast in the book of Revelation, it's described in chapter 13 as having 10 horns, and it's got features characteristic of a leopard and of a bear and of a lion. And this is all coming from Daniel 7, um, in which there are a series of um, beasts that look like a lion, a bear, and a leopard. And then the fourth beast has 10 horns. So by Daniel's or in Daniel's time, he's talking about a series of successive kingdoms, but um, the last of which consumes all the previous ones. But by John's time in the first century, that fourth beast has come and it has consumed the previous beasts. Um, and, and so it has shares all the features of the fourth beast in Daniel. Um, similarly, the beasts, or, or as we look, as we saw earlier with respect to Mystery Babylon, an angel interprets this imagery for John, saying in Revelation 13, 9 to 10, that the um, seven heads represent a, a series of successive kings. Likewise, an angel interprets the imagery for Daniel, saying that the beasts represent successive kings. Now, the in both um, sets of imagery, both in John's vision and in Daniel's vision, the beast fa faces a fiery fate. In Revelation 19.20, that beast is thrown into the lake of fire, whereas alive, whereas in Daniel 7, that beast is killed and its body is thrown into a river of fire. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible contradicts itself. It's just using two different imagery, two different images to describe the same fate. But again, that fate is interpreted by author by interp interpreters in the um, book itself. An angel interprets it, or John himself interprets it, the fate of the beast as destruction in chapter 17. And likewise, the angel interprets the fate of the beast in fire as symbolizing the destruction of a kingdom's dominion in Daniel 7, 23 and 26. So all of this imagery of torment forever and ever in the lake of fire uh, on the part of the beast, the devil, and the false prophet is symbolism communicating destruction of the entities that those symbols represent. Um, so, uh, and, and this is also consistent with how John interprets the lake of fire itself. You see, the image, this picture of a lake of fiery torment, is interpret, interpreted by John as well as by God himself. Uh, John in, in Revelation 20.14 and God in Revelation 21.8, um, they both say that the lake of fire is the second death. It's They're interpreting the lake of fire as symbolizing the second time that the wicked will die. So Revelation 14 and 20 speak of smoke rising forever from torment in the lake of fire as symbolism for dying a second time and forever. It's, again, the imagery is authoritatively interpreted as death and destruction. It's not to be taken literally as torment forever and ever. Now, turning from Bible to theology, what I want to discuss here in the closing um, minutes of my presentation is the issue of substitutionary atonement. All throughout the Bible, substitutionary atonement is, um, is taking the place of another one who deserves to die and therefore dying yourself. So for example, in Leviticus 17, the sacrifice of the lamb um, on the altar is described as the life, um, the life that is in the blood of the animal making atonement for your souls. Um, and, and as John Stott explains, the, the picture here is that one life is forfeit, that is, deserves to be taken, but another life is sacrificed instead. This is what substitutionary um, atonement is all about. And that's why the New Testament uses this language of sacrificial lambs to describe Jesus in John 1.29, 1 Corinthians 5.7, and 1 Peter 1.19. Um, we see it all throughout the New Testament that Jesus is said to have died for his people. Um, and the word for in language like he died for, for them, he died for the sheep, he died for us. The Greek preposition that's translated for is the preposition is either the preposition anti or the preposition who pair. And as Dan Wallace and other Greek grammarians explain, these, um, these prepositions when describing Jesus's work on the cross, his death on the cross for his people is the language of substitution. One person, namely Jesus, dying um, instead of, in the place of, those who deserve to die. 
So the work of Christ on uh, in dying on the cross as a substitution um, as a substitute for us um, means that those in whose place Jesus did not die, if if we Calvinists are right, or those who fail to self appropriate Jesus's saving death via faith in Arminianism and other forms of non Calvinism. Um, the lost, in other words, in hell, must therefore die as the wages of their sin, because that's what Jesus suffered as the wages of our sin. But it's not just the issue of substitutionary atonement. It's also the issue of immortality, um, which, according to the New Testament, is secured for those united to Jesus. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for example, that as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. Remember, the man of dust was the one who returned to the dust, the dust whence he came. Um, but as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And so he says this perishable, perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. He's talking about believers in the resurrection being made immortal, not all humankind. And then he says uh, in Romans 6 that if we've been united with Christ in a death like his, then we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. If we have died with him, we will also live with him, because Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. So immortality is something that is secured to those who are united to Jesus. So that is the th biblical and theological case, a sampling of it. The reality is that the biblical and theological case for conditional immortality or annihilationism is much, much more expansive than we've covered here. But this was a helpful sampling. And remember, we asked at the beginning of this presentation the question, eternal punishment, fact or fiction? And what we've learned is that, yes, it is fact. But the question is, what is eternal punishment? Is it living forever or is it being dead forever? Remember, the question is, does the Bible, the, the passages that we've looked at, and does the substitutionary work of Christ suggest that the unsaved will be raised immortal, will live physically forever in hell, and that their punishment will be suffering forever in hell, as the doctrine of eternal torment contends? Or does the Bible teach that the unsaved will be raised still mortal, will die again in hell, and that their punishment is, is hell, like something like the electric chair or like heaven, uh, uh, fire from heaven destroying the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah? I'll leave it to you, but as is clear by now, I think that the biblical and theological data best supports conditional immortality. And with that, I will turn things over to you for any questions that you may have.